Maybe Paul, you will introduce yourself in what I mentioned you. Well, since Maria has just already done that, uh, uh, so um, um, I work at uh, Queen Mary Maxfield College um, in um, um, in uh, London. Um, I'd like to ask you, Noam, uh, about uh, something that you said in response to a question, a couple of questions back, uh, namely about um, words not having real world uh, a reference um, and. Um, um, I, I suppose what I'd like to, to uh, point out is that uh, some of those cases seem to be cases that are not accessible or not easily accessible um, um, to uh, consciousness. So, for example, the word house, you pointed out all these strange features of it, both now and in your writings, but I, I, I mean, it really takes you know, someone to point out those kinds of features before people uh, realise them. With other examples, though, um, I think the, the oddness, or you know, the, let's just say the fact that these phrases don't have real-world reference seems more easily accessible. So, for example, another uh, sentence um, of yours, um, I think it goes something like, um, the bank moved across the road after burning down, yeah. which seems at first like a perfectly straightforward sentence in English, we can all more or less reconstruct the train of of events, but then when you reflect on it for just a second, you think, huh, that's funny, you know, there can be nothing, no real object can have A burned down and then moved across the road, which is the point yeah. of the example. So, so my question is, um, at least for the latter kind of example, um, how is it that we are able to use those sentences so easily to convey a truth? Because it seems on first inspection at least that, you know, if a sentence either asserts or presupposes the existence of an object that, that does not exist, and indeed in many of these cases a, a, an object um, that could not exist, it seems on first inspection like they should either just uh, come out false or that they should come out as, you know, uh, presupposition failures. Actually, I should mention that Paul is the only person who writes on somatics who takes any of this seriously, so it's, <laughs> it's unique. Uh, but uh, I think what it means is just that most of what we do is unreflective. It's, uh, it's kind of like uh, seeing a rigid object in motion when there's, or seeing the moon illusion or uh, understanding other people. We have the slightest idea how we do it. Uh, we can't introspect into our own behavior, uh, any more than we can introspect into uh, falling bodies. I mean, it's just intuitively obvious that if you have two, two objects of different mass, uh, the one with uh, uh, a larger mass is going to fall faster. Well, this turns out to be false, but it's, uh, if we can't introspect into something as simple as, uh, say, falling bodies, or why some things fall and others rise. Now, how can we hope to introspect into anything as complicated as what the human mind is doing? You've got to study it from the outside, the way you study other things. And when you do, it's very hard. Uh, there are illusions about, one of the main illusions in the, go through all of intellectual history is that somehow the, uh, Ourse we ourselves ought to be the easiest thing to study because we can look into what's going on. So say, you know, Tom Nagel asks uh, what it's like to be a bat and uh, nobody can give the answer. But try answering the question, what it's like to be me. I mean, I don't think anybody can answer that question either. At least I can't. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you just, you can't pose questions like that. Uh, they, they don't mean anything. Uh, we, uh, to, to figure out what it's like to be me or a bat or a, um, you know, a nematode or no matter how simple it is, is a hard scientific question. And to ask what it's like to be a person, even yourself, is maybe the, one of the hardest questions. You can write novels about it. Or write poetry about it or something, but uh, you can't give a discursive account. Just you can't answer the question. Uh, and uh, I think 
we can't hope to answer the kinds of questions that you're talking about just by introspection. Somehow when people use the word bank, let's say, they automatically understand what you just brought out. And uh, they don't find it confusing unless you point out to them, look, this doesn't, technically doesn't make any sense. And then you get things like, say, Kripke's puzzles. Uh, but the puzzles arise because you're trying to, uh, to uh, present in a rational form uh, that's you know, somehow objective uh, things that are handled by people in a totally different way. If I may ask a very uh, sure. bit. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so he, I guess he gets a special dispensation. No, he, he gets, takes yeah, Paul series. gets special yeah. dispensation. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess my worry is that, um, um, you know, does this commit us to the existence of um, two systems that are capable of analyzing sentences like that? Um, there's, um, you know, the, the uh, I guess, the normal semantic interpretation system, which is indeed inaccessible um, um, to, um, to um, consciousness, as you say, uh, um, but then there's this other faculty by which we come along and say, mm, that's, that's funny. Yeah. But it seems that this other faculty is itself doing some kind of semantic analysis yeah. of those sentences. And so we seem to be left with a kind of what words from the face, you know, on the face of it, but like a slightly uh, ontologically costly system, whereby we have two systems that can do some kind of semantic analysis. Well, I think, I think we have to set up two different systems. There's our many different systems. In fact, I think there's a, probably a high level of modularity in the mind. Uh, one of our capacities, we call it a science forming capacity, uh, which every one every ha has in some fashion, is to try to make sense of our experience in a coherent way. I mean, uh, Russell once pointed out that the only thing we're really confident about as our own immediate experience. And the rest of inquiry, including all of science, is to try to give some coherent account of what this experience is. And I think that's basically right. Uh, this science forming capacity, which uh, I mean, children use to make sense of the world, the primitive tribes use and so on, is, uh, is just a different one. It's also trying to make sense of the use of language. Uh, so for example, when you uh, a, a child, let's say, if present you in a, a Piagetian type experiment where you know something moves and something else moves, uh, the child will automatically set up a, a cont an invisible contact between them. You know, there's got to be some invisible mechanical thing that's causing them to interact, because that's just the way we see the world. Uh, that, in fact, that's a a major event in the history of science it was when Newton showed that it doesn't work. When he uh, uh, demonstrated that the, what was called in the mechanical philosophy, the assumptions about the nature of the world that were made by every great scientist, you know, Galileo, Leibniz, Descartes, Huygens, everyone, and Newton himself, he believed it. Uh, that's why he regarded his discoveries an absurdity that no person with any scientific understanding could pay any attention to, but it just happened to be true, uh, that uh, you can't have uh, a mechanical universe, uh, that you have uh, what he and others regarded as a kind of occult property, a uh, action without contact it can't happen. And uh, our intuitive way of understanding the world just happens to be different from the way the world appears when we apply our science forming capacities to it. Uh, that was a wrenching moment. You know, in fact, uh, it changed the whole nature of science. So for Galileo, the great scientist of the early modern period, uh, the goal of science was to show that the world is intelligible. Uh, post Newton, it changed. It took a long time for it to sink in, but basically changed. We give up the hope of understanding the world. We just try to understand theories about the world, which is totally different. Uh, that's, and you get you know, uh, apparent contradictions, like Hume, who understood this, uh, uh, pointed out that Newton's 
the greatest achievement was to show that uh, there are mysteries which we will never comprehend. Uh, he was referring to things like action without contact, interaction without contact. On the other hand, you get modern scientists and philosophers like uh, David Deutsch, uh, David Abraham, many others, uh, in fact, generally, who condemn what's called mysterianism. That is, the, that, that is, there are things that we cannot comprehend. That's Dan Dennett, lots of others. This is uh, some kind of pathology, because in principle, we can understand anything. Well, what they're claiming is something quite, uh, they have already internalized the change of the conception of science from trying to discover an intelligible world given up by the time Newton's discoveries sank in uh, to trying to discover intelligible theories. And maybe we can de develop an intelligible theory about anything, every, you know, about almost anything, maybe anything you can think of. But that doesn't mean that the world's going to be intelligible. So mysterianism just almost has to be true. I think it was proven by uh, Newton, in fact, though he didn't like it. He thought it was absurd. Uh, Hume recognized it, recognized, look, it's true. What can we do with it? Uh, Locke recognized it. So Locke, you know, uh, uh, one of his great insights was, you know, what's called Locke's suggestion in the history of philosophy that uh, he said that just as there are, he put it the theological framework, but we can extract it from that. Uh, what he said is just as God added to matter uh, properties which we cannot comprehend, like action at a distance, uh, so God might have super added to matter uh, a faculty of thinking. It's the hypothesis of thinking matter, which was then it kind of opened up the possibility of of really having a scientific psychology. It was kind of dropped for a couple of centuries, but that's it, basically. Uh, and you have to try to figure out, well, what is the property of whatever's in there that uh, uh, allows thinking? But I think that gets right back to your question. Uh, we can, with our scientific capacities, we can look at this and say, hey, there's something really wrong here. We have to have another a system for describing it which doesn't have these internal contradictions and that's just a different system than uh, what we call common sense or ordinary ways of looking at things and within the that system you can develop in fact you try to develop a notion of reference so in say physics or linguistics or any other uh, kind of organized inquiry you you hope that the entities that you construct, mental entities that you construct, symbolic entities, you hope that they uh, actually pick out something that exists in the world. So if you scientists think they found the Higgs boson, uh, they would like to believe that there is a Higgs boson out there, you know. And uh, if uh, linguists talk about phonemes, they'd like to say, yeah, there's something real that's a phoneme. Uh, but that's a totally different notion from the ones in our ordinary language. And in fact, this leads to a lot of problems in contemporary philosophy, I think. Like take the whole twin earth discussions uh, or the idea that, you know, the water is H2O and all of those discussions. They're just mixing up two different systems. Uh, you can't ask whether water is H2O in natural language, say English, because it doesn't have the word H2O. That's from another system. You can't ask whether water is H2O in chemistry because it doesn't have the word water. I mean, of course, chemists use it informally, but they have H2O and not water. There's no, if you actually look at what water is in human language, it's a very complex notion. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with H2O, of course. But uh, so even, you can't even pose the questions that are discussed in the twin earth literature because of mixing two quite distinct systems. And it's kind of curious because the, the philosophers who develop these systems believe something that you know, comes from Quine and Wittgenstein and so on, that, you can, that words don't have meaning except inside a language. Okay. Well, if you believe that, 
then if you mix up two, two languages, it's going to be incoherent. You know? And uh, so you'll get what looks like a sentence, water is H2O, but water is getting its meaning from English and H2O is getting its meaning from chemistry. And chemistry is a system which at least strives to have reference. That's the whole point of science. And English is a system that doesn't strive to do anything. It's just, it's just like uh, walking, it's what it is. You know? And it doesn't happen to have reference. 